Good evening, and uh, welcome to the Spring 15 pitch. Thanks for coming. Yay! So many of you are pitching tonight. Why don't you just quickly stand up if you're pitching an event uh, project tonight? Thank you and congratulations because you've already been chosen out of a much larger pool of, of uh, pitch applications to pitch tonight. So that's already a win. Um, the way that this, my name is Lori Loeb and I'm a professor in the computer science department and I'm the director of the Digital Arts Leadership and Innovation Lab or the DALI Lab in the computer science department. It's funded by the Newcomb Institute and the CS department. And I'm one of the judges. What's going to happen tonight is this. So each group is going to come up. They have exactly two minutes to pitch their ideas. And if you hear some music, do we, can you play the music? <laughs> That's the sign <laughs> that your time is up and it's only going to get louder. <laughs> so that when, we, when that music starts, just know your time is up, and it's so you need to wrap it up. So we're going to be very strict about the two minutes. From the minute you begin, you have exactly two minutes. And it's going to go fast, one after the other after the other. And as you guys know, we'll have a queue going, a sort of on deck line going. So make sure that you keep track of the order and that you come on up when there's when you're where like fifth or something. Um, I think when the project ahead of you is presenting, you want to be waiting. At least, but usually we have about two or three people up here waiting. So it'd be nice to have two or three. So if you know the first four, three people should be up here now, for example, waiting um, along the side. And so make sure that there's always at least two groups up here, and you should just be ready to go. Um, so to, this event is sponsored by the Dolly Lab and by Den, the Dartmouth Entrepreneurial Network. And uh, we're really excited to do it. The winners tonight receive uh, first prize is $3,000, second prize is $2,000, third prize is $1,000, and the audience winner, so those of you who are here just as an audience member, uh, you'll be voting on your winners, and the audience winner receives $2,000. And in addition to the funding, and that's su supplied by Dan, in addition to the funding, you also receive an offer of design and development help from the Dolly Lab, and you receive an offer of some venture help from Den. So they'll help you get your idea up and running and get it to the next step. So the way that you're, the criteria for voting is as follows. So we're looking for pitches that are original and novel and exciting. We're looking for pitches that are uh, well delivered. So at the end of the two minute pitch, it should be clear to you what this idea is, that the team that's working on it is the right team, that they have the right resources, maybe minus a little bit of design and development help and a little bit of funding. But given those resources so that they would win, that they'd be act able to actually take it to the next step. That the idea has impact of some sort, so if it's a project that will help three people, it's probably not as powerful. You wouldn't give it as good a score as something that's going to have real impact for a larger group of people. Or maybe if it's impact for three people but it's profound, that might qualify. So you decide what impact means, but it should have impact. So again, a creative and novel, innovative idea, something you haven't seen before, an idea that has the right team and the right skill set to be able to make it happen, given the resources they would win from the pitch. It's well delivered, so we understand what the idea is, and it's an idea that has impact. So that's how you're going to be choosing the winners. So on the ballot, you'll see that there's a spot at the top where you should mark if you're a member of the Dolly Lab, you know who you are. Mark that off. And then mark off if you're just regular public, or if you don't, if you leave it blank, we'll assume that you're here as a general public uh, audience member. Choose the five projects, just put an X by those five projects that you think meet, are the best in, those cri in the criteria that I've laid out here. 
Okay, and then at the end of the time, we're going to go fast and furiously through the 20 pitches. At the end, there'll be people up at the back by the doors. You quickly get them your uh, get get them your ballots. Please move quickly so that we can start to tabulate. There'll be food outside and some beverages, and we're going to quickly tally up the audience winners. The judges will go and huddle in the corner and make their winners, and then we'll come back here and announce the winners. So the sooner you get us the ballots, the sooner we can get back and give you the decision. So you'll hear the decisions tonight. Are there any questions or anything? OK, so let me introduce the judges. The judges tonight, there are two judges. Um, well, there are, there are five judges altogether. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, so the first judge is Jack O'Toole. Jack was a presenter at the very first pitch event that happened spring, winter um, of 14, I believe, was the first one. And uh, Jack is a professor in, at Thayer and is the, <laughs> I think, and a, no? OK, well, he's just a great guy. <laughs> <laughs> we'll be a great judge. <laughs> and the next is J Jamie Coughlin. Jamie's the director of entrepreneurship at Den, and we're really thrilled to have Jamie be a part of this whole event, and Den be a whole part of whole, a great partner in this event. Tim Tregobov is the technical director at the Dolly Lab and has been a judge all of the times times that all, each one of the pitch events. In fact, I think the pitch is his idea from the start. <laughs> And Kiko Lam is another judge tonight. Kiko is a uh, master's student in the computer science department in, uh, with a concentration in digital arts. She was an undergrad here, a 14 in, from the econ department, and she the, was the winner of the Hack Dartmouth uh, hackathon that happened uh, earlier this year. So, and I'm one of the judges as well. Great, is that anything else? No, Good. that should be it. Let's um, start. Yeah, so we have, we'll be going Thanks on for, coming. for about the next hour. Um, and our first project is the Dartmouth Transparency Project. Do we have time to get that? Um, one second, I just need to flush it. Oh, she's got it. 20, 20 minutes, right? Two? Two. Okay. <laughs> Close. Hi, everyone. My name is Taryn. And soon on the screen, you will see the Dharma Transparency Project, a website designed to make information and statistics regarding Dharma-specific issues readily accessible to students and faculty. I came up with this idea as I was trying to incorporate what I'm learning in the classroom to find solutions to problems within Dartmouth. And what I've learned in the classroom is the importance of numbers and statistics and the importance of understanding an issue before you try to solve it. But as I tried to, f to understand more the, the most basic issues at Dartmouth, DDS financing, my hour-long Google search left me with one or two results. And as I turned my attention to a variety of other Dartmouth issues, as I dug through the archives at Rahner, read through Dartmouth publications, and read through the Office of Institutional Research, I realized the same thing. The numbers are available, but they're not accessible. They lie under layers of broken links they look like 1990s spreadsheets, and most of them are just the bare minimum required by higher ed law. But they exist. And this provides an opportunity to build a website that will compile the data into one forum. A forum that will make it so students, with just one click, will have the ability to see numbers on a Dartmouth-specific issue. A website that will contextualize the data, in, not only within Dartmouth's history, but within numbers from other peer institutions. It will uncover more data and it will visualize the data to tell stories, something that the Dolly Lab has done so well in the past, like the Project Dartmouth Energy Initiative. With the help of the Dolly Lab, this project will serve as a model for other universities to follow. It will increase institutional memory, improve student experience and a variety of student groups, and it will hold the, the upper administration accountable during a time where it needs to be held accountable, during a time where so much change is being implemented and an unprecedented level of data is being released. I have met with faculty, professors, students, and all of them, are, there's a thirst for this knowledge. And to end with a quote from Professor Nichols from a faculty meeting last month, maybe since we're an educational institution, we could do some research. But in order to do that research, we need numbers, we need statistics, and we need a home for transparency. And I think the Dharma Transparency Project would provide just that. Thank you. Thank you. 
Hansen, and I'm here to present you Surf Saver. This is a great presentation. <laughs> there are over 40 million extreme water sport users worldwide. While they're out enjoying the waves, a lot of them don't think about the risks that they're taking. What happens when a surfer gets caught in the riptide, or a gust, a gust of wind takes someone's kite or sail? Current safety equipment, like life jackets, are cumbersome. They get in the way of surfers trying to paddle out, or in the way of harnesses and other equipment. So users need a device that will provide adequate support in the event of an emergency that will be unobtrusive during their normal water activities. So I present to you Surf Saver. It's a rash guard with a CO2 pull tab and an air bladder for flotation activation in the event of an emergency. During initial prototype testing, I found out <clears throat> that <clears throat> while activated, it adds enough buoyancy to be classified as a special water sport PFD. Its easily accessible activation pull on the left shoulder is a natural position for when someone's in danger. While it inflates on the chest and on the back, the air bladder is focused on the upper half of the torso to ensure that it doesn't get in the way of any equipment like a harness. As I mentioned earlier, there are nearly 40 million active water sport users worldwide, and that number is only growing. They generate over $6.5 billion of revenue per year. So here's where you come in. I'm looking for a spectacular design team to help me refine my designs and improve my prototypes. I'm looking for manufacturing and marketing partners to help out with double layer neoprene fabrication, as well as surf companies that might help us get in the air, and as well as financial support to make all of this happen. My name is Phoebe Hoffman. Thank you for listening, and I hope to catch a wave with you soon. So our next project is NeuroAlert. I'm George. I'm Jordan. And together representing um, NeuroAlert. Did you know that in the US, about 20% of all auto crashes are due to driving fatigue? Did you also know that your brain emits waves and it's possible to detect when someone is falling asleep using these brain waves? We present NeuroAlert, a smartphone app that uses brain waves from this news headband to detect when you're falling asleep and then alert you via smart watch to wake you up. We seek to address the problem of um, road accidents due to people falling asleep on the wheel. If you also find yourself struggling to keep your eyes open in that 2A or 3B, this app might also be for you. A Dartmouth inaugural hackathon without any knowledge in neuroscience a priori, we dug into the details of brain waves scrambling through all kinds of research papers. And at the, in less than 24 hours, we developed a smartphone app, NeuroAlert, that uses brain waves from this muse headband to detect when you're falling asleep, and then alerts you via a Pebble smartwatch by sending a vibration on your wrist. And we ended up winning um, Palantir's prize for the best reward project. Yeah, so in terms of how it works, um, the Muse headband uses a process known as EEG to detect five different kinds of brain waves, alpha, beta, gamma, delta, and theta. And the intensity of each brain wave actually corresponds to a certain brain state. So for example, delta waves um, mean that you're, you're tired and beta waves re respond uh, to uh, alertness. So for example, right now we're using um, actually your blinking patterns to determine when you fall asleep, but in iterating this, pr this project, we would have a more advanced algorithm that would be based on the ratios of different brain waves. So we're, we're requesting support from Dali and Den um, to move forward with this, and um, we think this app is cool, not only because it can detect, detect brain waves, but also reduce the number of car crashes due to driver fatigue. Thank you. Good job, guys. All right, and up next, we have the Thought Project. My name is Julia Marino, and I'm here to tell you about the Thought Project, an initiative to increase academic community at Dartmouth. The first phase of our development was the creation of a residential community for curious, engaged Dartmouth students. We received 60 applications for 25 spots, and our website has had over 500 visitors. But our residential community is just the beginning. A problem that we want to help solve is the difficulty of tracking the endless number of events that come through the campus blitz list 
and the resulting low student attendance at some Dartmouth events. We propose the creation of a social networking events calendar that combines all the events that are happening on campus into a single live feed. You'll be able to log in with your Facebook information, RSVP to events, and invite your friends. And you'll even be able to um, be alerted to events based on your specific profile of interests and hobbies. What we want to do is combine the content of the campus splits list and the Dartmouth events calendar with features of popular websites like Facebook, Meetup, and the recommendation feature of Amazon. But our ultimate goal is, to, is not just to help people connect online. We want to facilitate real life, person to person interactions. The common room of our residential community will serve as a central hub for users of our website, students who are curious, passionate, and interested in the life of the mind. We'll host discussions, faculty dinners, and social events in our centrally located 450 square foot space. There is no place like it at Dartmouth. Ultimately, um, we are requesting support from, the Dolly and the De from Dolly and the Den and um, to build this site and to uh, uh, it modernize, our, modernize our space. Ultimately, this is a community building initiative. We want to tap into our various skill sets to build a social networking site of value for the Dartmouth community and a social space for the Dartmouth community. Thank you. And up next, we have Moving Average. I'm an Angel Adjim Moreno, and our project is Moving Average, Matchmaking for Study Buddies. Um, so our entire team are actually first-generation college students, and we were inspired by our struggle trying to adapt to Dartmouth. We wanted to help students, you know, avoid the mistakes we made. Um, so the current problems are, you know, there's no easy way for students to form study groups within their classes, you know, especially if they're shy. And, you know, currently 25% of students uh, utilize the tutoring clearinghouse, but there's only enough tutors for 40 to 80% of students. So there's a large unmet academic need. Uh, so we believe, you know, the greatest untapped potential on any college campus are the students. Um, so our idea is a platform that uh, integrates student schedules and classes and allows matchmaking with fellow classmates and easier access to campus resources. So here's kind of how the, uh, the app would work. Uh, you would request a study buddy based on your class schedule, and then if you have a match, you'll be formed with them, and they can find a study, study spot on campus to work at. And you can kind of identify open study groups you can join and then filter in depending on the class you have. It can also let you know, you know if certain study spots are like really full depending on how many users are currently there. Uh, so the state, we, you know, we really want to focus on getting this to work at Dartmouth, uh, making you know, students ut utilize it because study groups are super important. Uh, they're associated with better grades and better retention. And you know, it's clear there's you know, a huge unmet need. Uh, and then we want to spread to the Ivy Leagues because you know, Ivy League students have a really high uh, academic achievement profile. And we want to show that even at these institutions, there's a large uh, you know, unmet need. And we want to show that you know, this can be spread across the country, even if it's used at the Ivy Leagues. Uh, so the development stage, you know, the first part uh, is what we're focusing right now, is developing a study group app that, you know, people can use. And, you know, hopefully through this and learning what students do and how they use it, we want to get to the point where, you know, this gives actionable data for colleges used to um, create better academic policies that focus on student achievement and academic retention. Uh, so, you know, where we are right now, we're, you know, working on the design and wireframe of a prototype, and we hope to have one ready by the end of the summer so we can start um, actually um, beta testing and before the fall term starts with pre-orientation programs. Uh, we're also uh, getting feedback from the tutor clean house on how best to, you know, address the current unmet need that there is. Um, and so what we need uh, ultimately is uh, we want Dolly's experience, what, you know, producing apps that students at Dartmouth use because we really need to get, get it to work here so they can spread elsewhere. Um, and we also need, you know, mentorship, especially in higher education, to, you know, kind of know what works, what doesn't, and how, um, you know, the group can fill the gap. Um, so, I'm Harry. This is James. We're two hardcore math and computer science double majors. Um, everyone hates parking. Park it helps fix that. Existing parking apps don't have many users, and here's why. 
Current parking app companies need to install individual sensors for each parking space to then transmit that information to their mobile app. This is too expensive and non-scalable. Each sensor costs $300 to install and $5 per month to maintain. The main reason parking apps aren't very popular is that there simply aren't enough spaces with these sensors. San Francisco, for example, has spent millions on parking projects, but only 3% of their spaces have sensors. Bloomberg has estimated it would cost $69 million to install sensors for street parking for San Francisco alone. Thus, we reject the current model and replace it with our model, which takes input from camera feeds and computes parking availability for us. So the hardest part of this model is given a raw image of a parking lot, how do we figure out where the parking spaces are and whether they're available or not? We have already solved this problem with a deep learning convolutional neural network pre-trained model. So given a, a input image like this, our model is able to detect where the parking spaces are and whether they're empty or not. And the best part about the model is there is no hand labeling required. A computer does everything for you. And then our model would output parking availability and parking rate of each block to our mobile app every five seconds. So with this already done, where do we get the raw information? Fortunately, there already exists real-time image, uh, parking image data that we can purchase. And for streets and parking lots with all that information, we plan to build our own camera recording system. And on the cost side, our model is estimated to be more than 500 times cheaper than the current model. You can't even see the cost of our model, the bar on the graph. <laughs> Actually, though. <laughs> and with those accomplished, we just need to build a simple mobile app, which uh, as computer science majors, we know how to do within weeks fairly easily. And thank you very much. My name is Robin. And I'm Will. And our venture is Stepping Stone Investors. Now, the stock market can be very complex and difficult to get into, making it a resource that many fail to take advantage of throughout their whole lives. That is why we want to create Stepping Stone Investors, an educational mutual fund. Say you're a student. You give me $500, I return to you a portfolio of stocks that you can track as if it was your own. But on top of that, I provide you with educational reports on why each stock was selected, making it so you can learn the quantitative and qualitative methods involved in picking stocks. Furthermore, you can get your feet wet in the stock market as you follow your portfolio perform. This is an opportunity for students to learn to invest at no risk. Stepping Stone Investors takes 50%. You take 50%. These fees allow us to guarantee your investment. You always get back Exact, at least your initial investment. <clears throat> this is an opportunity for you to become smarter and more successful in your investing later in life at no risk. We are bringing the stock market to students of every background. Now, we already have several advisors, one of which is a world-class investor. And although we recognize the legal challenges our venture faces, several lawyers have confirmed the viability of our idea and that the startup costs would be within reason. We also have the working algorithm that would sort and distribute stocks and reports to our investors, making the marginal cost nominal and allowing us to serve every investor who's interested to invest in our mutual fund. Now, what we need is financial support from the DEN to meet with specialized lawyers and the help of Dolly to, to structure our servers and help with the graphic design of our product. We believe that Stepping Stone Investors is a, is a viable financially, as well as bringing the stock market to an entirely new demographic. Thank you. Thank you. All right, hi everyone, my name is James, and I'm here to present Frankie. It's a storybook for caregivers to enhance long-term care. 
This is our team. We're two engineers and a medical student, and we have a lot of experience working with caregivers, patients, and their families. Who here in the audience knows someone in long-term care? I do. And <laughs> for, for those of you that don't, um, you may find that understanding an individual's life story enables quality care. And it's not always easy to do. And long-term care is a pressing need in this country. We want to help caregivers leverage patient, patient stories to promote quality care because we believe that stories are compelling. So Frankie is a mobile app that curates compelling life stories to drive engagement and strengthen retention. How? We take data points such as personal stories or anecdotes and translate that into actionable care recommendations uh, such as redirections for an Alzheimer's patient that's throwing a fit. Here's an overview of our ecosystem. As you can see, we bring together caregivers, patients, and their families around personal narratives. This space is competitive with many point care apps, but we can bring out the best between these point care apps and patient story services. We've developed several prototypes, brought these prototypes to our users, and gotten feedback. And we have a plan to launch a pilot in the next year. We're looking for mentorship, uh, funding, and specifically design talent to bring this project to the next level. Uh, please reach out if you have any questions or comments. Thank you. Thank you, Dolly and Den. My name is Shama Alam, and I'm here to talk about breasts, specifically uh, breast reconstruction post mastectomy. We've seen some amazing presentations today, and the majority of them will have used images to convey their message, their purpose. Unfortunately, in healthcare, we inundate patients with text. The current online resources for breast reconstruction exceed recommended reading levels and are, and are still too difficult to understand for a large proportion of the population. A quick search on Google came back with 1.3 million hits on breast reconstruction post mastectomy. The decision making process for post mastectomy reconstruction is really complicated because there are various approaches to the procedure and also, excuse me. Um, Oh, wow, sorry, uh, patient, just even understanding um, of, 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 wow, patient understanding of, of literacy and just even, um, oh my God, I'm so sorry. Uh, it can reduce a patient's understanding of the options that are available to her as well as just her interest in reconstruction. So what we do, um, you know, you can take innovative and effective simple strategies from countries that use images to relay health information. For example, this one right here. This is a visual aid that was developed in, in Cameroon in West Africa to relay health information, drug information to non-literate female adults using antibiotics. It's incredible. No matter where you are, irrespective of whether it's in Cameroon or whether it's in the Bronx, low literacy is low literacy, which is why the use of images can be so powerful. People remember images better than text and for longer periods of time. So what do we want? We need your help. We need funding to secure a graphic illustrator and a Spanish translator. We also need support in um, in design and development of this simple paper-based tool. We want to go from something like this, an option grid, which is an evidence-based tool um, that talks about treatment options, but still, it's way too much text. We want to go from something like this to something like this. This is a prototype of another grid that I'm working on, looking at treatment options for early-stage breast cancer. Again, my name is Shama Alam. My colleagues are Dr. Marianne Durand and Professor Glenn Elwin, and we're from TDI, and we work in patient engagement and patient empowerment. And I thank you very much. Thank you.
So our next pitch actually uh, couldn't be here in person today, so instead we have a video. Um, This is Zipster. Hi everyone, my name is Jason Tinder and I'd like to introduce you to our new grocery delivery service that targets small towns. It's called Zipster. Zipster is a delivery service that helps people with a few certain pain points. People that are unable to shop for groceries, people like busy professionals, people who are elderly, sick, have children. People that don't have time to go to the grocery store in small towns can now have their groceries delivered. Here's how it would work. Imagine that you already knew that you were going to go grocery shopping on Wednesday between 4 and 6 p.m. Now imagine that you could make some extra money while you were grocery shopping for other people in your community. That's kind of the idea behind Zipster. The idea is that some people can help upload their grocery delivery list through an app and that other people with more time can shop for those people and make money doing so. Now, there are already some big grocery delivery services in some of the larger cities. For example, Amazon, Google, Instacart are already in big cities like New York, San Francisco, Boston. However, there is no app with a model that works in small cities like Hanover or the thousands of other small cities across the United States. That's what we hope to do by having a new model that can work easily from place to place. And the way we want to do this is we want to partner with grocery stores. We want to say to them, Look, we're helping you sell your groceries to more people and extend your reach. What we ask in return is we ask for you to help us advertise our service. In other words, we'd like you to place our sign or a sticker for our service in your store, letting people know we're here. And so by partnering with these stores, we're going to create a win-win situation with them, with the people who need grocery shopping, and with the people who want to make money doing the shopping. We're confident this is going to work great. Where we're at right now is we're about to go into development. We're hiring out most of this um, to coders. But what we need is we need people in the area who have computer science expertise, who can code apps, and who can also help us oversee the development of the back end. If you are one of those people, or you know a similar kind of person who would be interested, please email me. My email is tinder, yes, that's actually my last name, tinder.tu16 at dartmouth.edu. Thank you. Hello everyone, my name is John Hahn and I'm a rising third year med student at Geisel. My idea came from seeing the growing demands of physician time while at DHMC and rural Vermont clinic. And for over a decade, the federally mandated push to digitize healthcare has clashed with medicine, resulting in time that used to be spent connecting with patients now being spent hunched over computer screens or paper. Uh, my idea was to start as simple as possible and create a way to make electronic communication easier and more efficient for healthcare providers. Originally, I thought of an app, but over 25,000 people had beat me to the punch. This has created a very difficult environment where medical app developers feel compelled to show very expensive clinical trial data just to penetrate an already crowded market. Furthermore, the major complaint with software and web platforms developed for physicians was that they didn't seem to connect really well with doctors, and they seemed to be created by accountants or computer scientists who didn't have much literacy with sort of the culture of medicine. And uh, existing services for inbox management require too steep a learning curve, training of existing staff, too much user input, have difficulty being adapted into existing EMR or patient portals, and are prone to error as they have to accommodate a vast range of users. So thus the idea of an inbox or EMR plugin has, a, you know, which address healthcare specific needs came to be. And the provider would simply have to install the software, let it run its course, and incredibly minimal changes to their pre-existing sort of systems and the plugin would essentially read the message or email, searching for specific keywords, factoring in the sender, time sent, and sort it based on category. I envision this product to be combined the best of both worlds, an inbox and message management system with the autonomousness of a, sort of a spam filter. And um, it'll be a good plugin so, to allow um, email clients or EMRs to sort of integrate it just flawlessly. So scalability, um, I believe this product has great potential and to grow beyond its initial purpose. As once we can aggregate a large enough user base, our software will be able to do more than just messages and it's code of patients themselves. And hopefully, if I can acquire a large enough user base and a sophisticated enough software platform, we'll be able to triage patients themselves based on what they write to the physician. So this stage, Currently, we're, this idea is in its infancy. We're at the, sort of the napkin to screen stage. And um, being able to secure support from Den and Dolly would really give it a critical boost that the project needs in order to create a consumer-ready product. 
And uh, at the end of the day, if I can successfully free, successfully free up even a few minutes of a doctor's time, I know I can sort of improve the quality of care that a patient receives. And that quote right there is from an academic study done about something similar to this. And yeah, I want to change that. So <laughs> thank you. Um, hello, my name is Jordan. And I'm Andrew. We want to ask you a question. How many of you have been stressed here at Dartmouth? OK. Now, how many of you have actually reached out to resources on campus to help you deal with your stress? Well, I mean, we, of course, because I mean, we all know that students get stressed throughout the term, and whether it's because of exams or relationships or, or sleeping habits, what have you. And you know, the college knows that, right? That's why we have deans, counselors, and wellness peer mentors and other resources. But the reality is that you know, we, the, these resources aren't really helpful if we don't reach out to them. And because we as students, we don't want to really burn our friends with our issues to all the time. And you know, there's a lot of effort required in like, finding out what resources are good for you and making appointments. So we thought, well, you know, there's so many resources. Why don't we have a way for the resources themselves to reach out to the stressed students and, and help them? And that's where we come in with Helping Hand, because our goal is to connect individuals who are qualified to help others with stressed students over an anonymous mobile messaging platform. So the way our app works is every time you unlock your phone, we gather how stressed you are. And then periodically, we'll ask you to give us a few keywords about what's causing you uh, to be stressed. Um, and so we can tell you what times of day you're stressed and where on campus you're stressed. Um, and then the, the helpers, the qualified um, people to help you with your stress, can go in and say, um, that they want to help somebody with a particular category of stress. Um, and then they can start a chat with somebody that needs to chat in that um, stress category, and then they can talk anonymously with that student. Yeah, so some important things about this application are that only qualified um, individuals are allowed to reach out to stress students, so like people on campus such as deans and things like that. Um, we feel that anonymous communication, if done right, can actually be a safe outlet to express your emotions. And we think that this app could really revolutionize the way that students um, interact with stress management resources on campus. Um, we already have a, a complete working pro Android prototype, if you, as you saw. Um, we have a lot of interest and excitement from staff from the Student Health Promotion and Wellness Center, as well as members of the um, SBCSA. And I also be, have been conducting interviews this term to see how we can improve relationships between students and stress management resources. So with support from Dolly and Den, we hope to develop partnerships with stress management resources on or off campus, um, refine the app's functionality and design, build out an iOS version, and test and implement the, this app on campus next year. And with that, we're helping hand eliminating stress one hand at a time. Thank you. Hi, I'm Jim Filiano. I work with David Graber. I'm a neurologist at Hitchcock. And we pitch to you the Dartmouth app of neurometabolic disease, designed to quicken diagnosis of severe genetic neurologic disease. This is what happens to such patients. They can't walk, they can't talk, they can't clean themselves, they can't feed themselves, they can't tell you where they're in pain. And it's cruel because often there are several patients in the same family. It becomes the life's work of the parents to care for them and their clinicians and neuroscientists to help prevent and treat and care for these patients. To do so, we need the diagnosis, and we need the diagnosis now. The major obstacle that our app will defeat is that this is a large collection of rare diseases placed in a huge four-volume set that's expensive, cumbersome, and arcane. We have spent three decades distilling the diagnostic information into a simple book that has simple lists and tables and algorithms that help us bring the diagnosis quick, easy, and now. But with the help of Dolly and Dan, we can transform this into a user-friendly, interactable app that'll be available to 1.6 million US professionals, 5 million US patients and their families, scalable worldwide to approximately 10 times that amount, we know it works. You can see this on a YouTube video of two children, brother and sister, that I cared for. Here's the girl. Six hospitals didn't find the diagnosis. Nine years to diagnosis in a wheelchair. With two visits, we're able to 
use the algorithms, find the diagnosis, start treatment, and here she is from wheelchair to trampoline doing a back handspring. It's blurred because she's moving fast. Her brother, same story, both in college. This app provides hope to the families, the clinicians, the neuroscientists. What we need is design and app help from Dolly, business help from Den, and we need this now before this opportunity is grasped by others. Thank you very much. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Robert Halverson, and we are Run Right Smart Soul. Millions of Americans run each year, and of those, a full 50% are likely to get injured. That means plantar fasciitis, ankle sprains, runner's knees, shin splints, tendonitis, ITBS, ACL tears, stress fractures, career-ending tears and sprains. You'd think that by now, we'd have the data to connect specific running technique with injury, but we don't. That's why the risk of injury is so high, is because no one really knows exactly why runners get injured. Orthopedist Dr. Paul Hecht says that we don't have this data because the technology doesn't exist to actually measure comprehensive foot strike dynamics on a massive scale. Until now. Introducing the Run Right Smart Soul, a pressure mapping shoe insert that gives the user quantitative data about foot strike pattern and forces felt by the body. You get everything from force distribution to impact attenuation, pressure maps, gait analysis. And this is really, really important because now runners can use this device to find their unique foot strike patterns over months and even years. Something completely impossible by going to a treadmill for one day at a doctor's office. Users can use this device to help them avoid injury by it letting them know when they're overtraining or when their shoes have worn out and are no longer safe. Users can also use this device to tell them how to um, learn new running techniques by giving them feedback on their specific goals. Now we have the technology to analyze this data, but right now it's done in MATLAB and Terminal. If we can turn this into an app, we can crowdsource running data like never before, opening up new research opportunities to finally find that link between specific running patterns and injury. So we humbly ask that the Dolly Lab help us design, develop, and deliver this app that could make it all possible, as well as for financial support and advice from the DEN to help us turn our prototype insole into a finalized, patented device. Together, we can make running a safer sport. Thank you. Hello everyone, my name is Sam and my team members are Armin and Shreya. We are Dartbook. Wait, where's the clicker? <laughs> <laughs> there we go. All right, each term, Dartmouth students spend hundreds of dollars on textbooks through Amazon and, Dar and Wheelock books. Other students use uh, Facebook and Blitz to buy and sell textbooks with each other. Both e these are options are either ineffective, inefficient, or are very expensive. Um, we um, currently uh, we conducted a survey of 150 Dartmouth students, and 50% said that they do not sell their textbooks. Meanwhile, this same group of students reported that 86% of them would download an app that enabled them to buy and sell textbooks. Um, our solution is Dartbook an easy way to buy or sell textbooks via your iPhone. Dartbooks allows students to log in to the app using their Dartmouth student ID and password. From there, the app gets all the classes that you're currently enrolled in and returns a list of personalized textbook recommendations. You can also search for books via a title or a class name. If you wanna post to the app, you can do that from, uh, from the phone. You can, um, or you can let Dartbooks do all the heavy lifting by auto-populating a post based on classes you've already taken. Our app uses push notifications to instantly connect buyers and sellers, and we're working on implementing a instant messaging service into the app. Our goal is to become Dartmouth's most convenient way to buy and sell textbooks. 
We're about 50% done with the development, and we have a working prototype. We're aiming to launch version one before the fall term textbook rush. Uh, right now, this app will be available to Dartmouth students only, but we're hoping to expand to other schools. And we also are hoping to expand beyond the textbook market and make this like an online virtual student marketplace. To make our dream a reality, we are looking for funding to support the development, promotion, and expansion of our app. Thank you. So yesterday, there was a blackout on campus eateries and everyone flocked to Molly's restaurant. And before long, the wait time is two hours. This is because imagine you go in first, you wait for the menu to come because they don't have enough to, they don't have enough to go around. And second, um, you, uh, if you want a glass of water, you wait for them to go and ask you what you need and then we'll come back with your water later. And in the end, you wait for your bill to come out and your credit card to be um, swiped and returned. I wish that um, my, my request would be fulfilled faster by the waiter. So I bring to you readily an app for signaling your request at your table. So you can see that uh, you can get the e-menu from here um, from uh, scanning your phone at the restaurant. And then you can look at the nutritional information um, and place an order easily. Now, if you want more water, your knives and fork replaced, you can um, use this uh, panel uh, with all these buttons to uh, uh, remake these requests. And you can also pay using readily. These are the pre-calculated tip options. You punch in your card number and click Submit. Now, for the waiters, they can look at this um, map of the tables in the restaurant and see which table makes which request. For example, this one has their order placed, and they also uh, request two glasses of water. So I have looked into other similar apps like uh, QuickServe and Rail, but they really capitalize on um, self-serving, which eliminates the need for the waiters. But I believe that dining out is a social experience that could just be made more efficient using Readily because the waiter can now fulfill their requests faster. So my name is May, and um, what I'm asking for is some mentorship and also technical support, i.e. some coding to bring to life my user experience design. Um, I plan to launch Readily 1.0 in uh, Shushia, where I spend a lot of time waiting for my sort of favorite salmon rolls to come. Um, thanks for your time for Readily. Hey guys, we're up Lyft, and meet Lisa. She's shopping at Walgreens. Um, as she's leaving, she sees her receipt, and it says that she can win $10,000 in cash, but only if she fills out a survey. And she crumples up her receipt, and she puts it in her bag. Later that night, she painstakingly fills out that receipt information on the survey website. And she sees pages like these. Five minutes later, she's like this. <laughs> 13 minutes later, she's still doing it. So this is not an anomaly. Clearly, Walgreens and other businesses need customer feedback, but they're doing it in very ineffective ways. So the survey experience actually really sucks. Um, and, this is and this results in businesses only getting um, feedback uh, from like the two ends of the extremes. Either you're very satisfied or you're very dissatisfied. We're hoping to unlock the middle part. So um, uplift. Is, um, is a solution that's win-win for everybody, and the following will be some features that make us stand out from the few and outdated competitors that we have. So first, push notifications. You'll be getting a push notification the moment you're walking out the door, whether or not you bought anything, and this is through the iBeacon. Um, so no more crumpled up receipts. You don't have to like, look in your bag for that survey link. Um, next, every survey will be in the same place on your phone, and they're all gonna be very easy. You can see exactly how many questions and how many uh, points you'll get per survey. And you can redeem these points anywhere regardless of which survey you, um, you took for like, which business. 
Um, and then once you know like where you want to redeem it, you can choose what kind of reward. And on the business side, they'll get real-time feedback and also data visualization. Um, and so, so far, we've already made an Android um, prototype that's on, that's on the, dem the video right there. And we've already met with several businesses uh, with very positive results. And this summer, we're hoping to live together um, and work full-time on a two-month sprint with the expected July 15th release. And during this time, we'll be working on the iOS app, and we'll be hoping to use the funds for our room and board. And why isn't every store experienced five stars? because they haven't been uplifted yet. <laughs> so the, here is our team. I'm Hannah, this is Richard, and thank you so much. Hi, I'm Jordan Hall, a 16 computer science major, and this is Tori Neville, also a 16, and we're here today to talk to you about Beatnik. Beatnik is a web-based application for bridging the gap between fans and the creatives that they love. Currently, if a fan wants to contribute to a creative or their creative work, they'll use a platform like Kickstarter or Indiegogo. But these platforms have shortcomings. One big shortcoming is that the only way to contribute is money. Fans don't necessarily have this money, and artists need more than just money. These platforms also don't provide long-term support for the creative, so once a project is finished, that's it. A last problem is significant barriers to the discovery of new artists and new projects. So platforms like these are dominated by people with already massive networks, people that are famous. What if creators could make their own decisions about the projects that get created? What if fans could offer their own skills and talents to creative projects and creatives? What if collaboration amongst artists was made as easy as it possibly could be? What if creators could just create? We're hoping that Beatnik is a solution. Beatnik would be about more than just money. Imagine a scenario where your favorite band is coming out with a new album, but this album is incomplete and needs something like album artwork. Instead of throwing money at the effort, maybe you design the album cover artwork. What's What's a better way to engage with your favorite band or creatives that you love? Beatnik would be invested in long-term support of its creatives. So every creative would be given a profile through which they could engage with their fan base, grow their fan base, and also leverage their fan base for new ideas for future projects. And hopefully, Beatnik would allow creators to just create. Content would be hosted directly on the platform. So creators wouldn't have to worry about production and distribution. And for things like novels and music, Beatnik would be very involved in helping books get published and providing the funds for things like that. Also, the platform would encourage collaboration amongst artists throughout its entirety. So imagine a scenario where a writer writes a story that's loved by his or her fan base, and then a filmmaker approaches them through the platform to make an independent film based off that. What if the next thing you watch on Netflix was something made in this way? supported by fans that love the work and the creatives. Hopefully, this is the reality that Beatnik can bring to fruition. Thank you. Our last presentation for today is Finas Cosina. Thank you. Um, good evening, everyone. I am Josefina Ruiz, and I'm here to present to you Finas Cocina, which would be the first ever truly authentic Mexican cuisine here in Hanover, New Hampshire. Um, I bring Finas Cocina uh, as, a, as a way to bring Mexican food to the very uh, hungry community, both physically and socially. Uh, because as we know, food is something that uh, is constructed in our society and it's very, it builds community and so forth. Um, I'm here for three reasons. The first is that I wanna get found as a minority, uh, as a rising minority entrepreneur here on campus. Uh, the second is that I want to build connections with people who are interested in uh, food entrepreneurship and just Latino foods uh, and to help our Latino community here on campus. Uh, and third, I want to get the money so that I can actually afford to buy the uh, rather expensive ingredients to make the food and deliver it to you. 
Uh, my motivations arose when I was a freshman and I was uh, severely disappointed by the fact that there were, I had no access to the food that I grew up with. And that can be represented in many of the peers that I have here on campus. Um, if you just like took a survey and asked them, you'd find that out. Uh, and that gives for a difficult trans transition to Dartmouth. Um, and to just give you some facts, I did market research where out of 262 responses, 92% of them said that they would like Mexican uh, food here on campus. And furthermore, the people who have had the delight of eating my food have said, how are we going to cater from you? How can we cater from you? So I need support so that I can actually bring that to the d different Dharma's departments. Uh, so I'm looking for, again, mentorship, business development, guidance, and most of all financial support and if you allow me to I would love to share my love for food with you and that is a cacti yes you do eat cacti um, and so let's talk uh, and hopefully for the judges there's food out there for you thank you can we get the lights on thanks that was so loud um, hi everyone just a quick note, make sure to cast your votes, five and only five. Drop them off at the door on the way out, but don't leave, come back. Um, just get some dinner, we have some dinner in the atrium. We'll call you back once we've counted up all the votes. Okay, so it was a great event. It was one of the hardest two judges that we've had, to judge that we've had so far because really the, the projects are getting better, the pitches are getting better, the variety of pitches and pitchies, uh, people doing pitching is, <laughs> uh, it, it, yeah, uh, <laughs> is improving and it's really exciting to see that developing over time, so it's great. This is the third pitch event that we've had this year uh, academic year and we hope to do it again. Uh, we won't do it in the summer, but we'll start up again in the fall. So it's been really exciting to see. So congratulations to everybody who pitched. Just getting up and doing it is a great uh, process and a great opportunity to learn and get better. And the hope is to just create a place here, a culture here at Dartmouth where people are willing to just throw out, you know, pull, come together with ideas, develop them and pitch them and then find support for making them a reality. So that's exciting. So I think I'll start with the audience winner. And um, this particular one was uh, won handily uh, amongst the audience and that is uh, Josefina Ruiz and Amaris <laughs> for Venus Cochina. So come on, come on up. <laughs> Congratulations. Thank you. I, I just want to say that everybody who is pretty much cheering for me, they all put their grain of salt in helping make this a reality from like the person who drove the food here and the person who got there to like help me because I was panicky because I didn't have food. So thank you. <laughs> Stay up here because we'll get a picture. Okay, and then in third place, so we thought the food was delicious, by the way. We devoured it. It was really great. You're all going to really enjoy it. It's exciting to think that there'll be more of that food here. So congratulations. Okay, and then in third place, I'll work my the way up from third to first. So in third place, w winning $1,000 um, and the support from Dolly and Dan. Um, is uh, Robert Halferson, Daniel Lee, Sam Gallagher, and Pranav for Run Right Smart Soul. So we, you know, as somebody who's spent a lot of time studying runs and strides and motion study, this seems like a really important, yeah. Really important app and uh, project, and so it was exciting. It has both some, some hardware development and some software. It's really great. Okay, in second place, we were really impressed by this one, by the power of that the impact of this project could have, 
And the winner in second place, $2,000, is James Filiano, David Graber, and Donald Avery for the Dartmouth app of <laughs> neurometabolic disease. Very exciting. And then in first place, drum roll, please. OK. Uh, Gurker and Singh, Richard Otto, and Hannah Kim for Uplift. So that one has big impact. It was great to see that you've already developed something, and we're excited to see where that goes. So for those who didn't, did you want to say something, Jamie? Oh, I'm going to get a picture. Yeah, let's get a picture with the judges. For everybody else, thanks for coming. We hope to hear more apps. Look for the, for, look for the announcements in the fall for the next pitch. And if you didn't win, come and talk to us. We'd be happy to talk to you about our, our response to each of the projects. All right, thanks. Good night.